hold on this computer. Okay, cool. All right, welcome everyone to seminar one on the Kita on the Kataev model. Now, I'm actually going to start possibly controversially uh, with something that is not the Kataev model, which is the transverse Ising chain. Um, uh, but the, I have I have a good reason for doing that. Uh, the main thing is I wanted to introduce in a very pedagogical way everything that I'm going to be using, uh, including what a spin is, what a fermion is, um, and more specifically, what the minimum things you need are to say this is a fermion, this is a spin, etc. The other thing I wanted, the other sort of abstract concepts I wanted to introduce in a, I want to say easier to understand model because the transverse Ising chain is a one dimensional model, whereas the Kataev model is two dimensional. So everything becomes more difficult bookkeeping wise. So while we still have a relatively simple 1D model, um, I wanted to introduce a couple of concepts that will come up that get used in the Kataev model, uh, specifically the Jordan, oops, specifically the Jordan Wigner transformation. Uh, which is important in one of the proofs about what the Kataev model ground, ground state is, uh, but also some general techniques like exploiting gauge freedom in fermions in order to simplify the calculations uh, and the technique of separating the Hilbert space into different sectors. Uh, and finally, uh, if we have time, I'm not entirely sure if it will, uh, I want to go over yeah, the, the topological phase transition that the transverse Ising chain has. So let's get started. So section one is what is everything or what is spin? Uh, and very simply, uh, I define a spin to be, that was my notes. Very simply, I define a spin to be a pair of <clears throat> a set of three operators, sigma, sorry, uh, Sx, Sy, Sz, uh, that satisfy the canonical spin commutator relations. Um, I will restrict. I will restrict us to the case of spin a half because talking about higher spins is not that helpful at this stage. So I'll. When in the specific case of spin a half, I'll write instead sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, uh, which should be interpreted as um, Pauli matrices. So respectively, one, one, minus i, i, and one minus one. Um, and these are interpreted as linear operators acting on the space C2. Or if you want to get more fancy, these are basis elements for the tangent space of SU2 or a basis for math frac SU2. Uh, and that definition works for arbitrary spins. Any spin is a representation of the Lie algebra of S SU2. Um, uh, now, the next definition I want to get out of the way is a fermion. Oh, sorry. One, one final thing. So I, what a more useful basis, I want to say, for the purposes of condensed matter field theory uh, is rather than dealing with sigma x or sigma y and sigma z, to deal with sigma plus, sigma plus, uh, sigma minus, and sigma z, uh, where sigma plus is a half sigma x plus i is sigma y, and sigma minus is the same but minus. Uh, and sigma z is just sigma z. And the reason that, that that's useful is that the commutator relations that these satisfy look kind of like bosonic commutators. So commutator sigma plus, sigma minus is sigma z. Not exactly like bosonic and commutators, but they're they're reminiscent enough that it's it's a useful thing to have. Sorry, this this is the one that doesn't look like boson. The one that looks like a boson is to go commutator sigma z sigma plus minus equals plus or minus uh, sigma plus minus. 
plus minus Isn't two. There, a seven as well? there yeah, is. Cool. Yeah, there is. Plus or minus two sigma plus minus. Um, and to make it look even more like a boson, we write that as sigma i sigma j and add a delta function, a chronic delta in this case, to say if these spins are on different sites, they commute, which is intuitive. If spins are on different sites, then they shouldn't be able to influence the eigenvalues. Yeah, so, sorry for starting in such a sort of obvious way, but hopefully it makes everything clear eventually. And more importantly, um, sigma plus acting on like the up spin is zero, the zero number. Um, and whereas sigma minus acting on the down spin is, uh, so whereas sigma plus acting on the down spin is sigma up, it is like cat up uh, with no extra normalization factors. So yeah, I want you to compare these commutators with those for a boson which is that the commutator of AI, AJ dagger um, equals delta IJ uh, and the commutator of A hash to mean like A plus um, A, A slash A dagger, I with the number operator, A dagger A, um, is like plus or minus the number operator. Hi, can you just quickly write out the definition of a hash? Sorry, I just haven't. Oh, a, oh, a hash. That's just like dagger if it's the top one, and my and no dagger if it's the bottom one. What do you mean if it's the top or if it's the bottom? Oh, as in like I've got a plus or minus on the oh. right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't, you may not want to write that one down because that may be off by a factor of minus one. Um, yeah, that, as the, that was a bit ad-libbed. But the point, the point is um, essentially the equivalence that we want to make ultimately is that like, if you imagine sort of physically you have a, you have a, so yeah, now, now would probably be a good time to talk about physics. So what is the transverse field Ising model? Um, and that is H equals sum minus J, sum J equals one to L minus one, sigma, how am I gonna do this? Yeah, I'll do it this way. Uh, minus JX, sigma X, sigma X, j j plus one plus minus j y sigma y sigma y j j plus one uh, minus h sum j equals one to l sigma j z so more specifically um what this corresponds to is a bunch of spins and in a line Hey, Alaric, say, yeah. Doesn't the usual Ising model have a JZ term as well? Uh, that is for, yeah, I've written it in a bit of a wonky basis, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, okay. right. So yeah, tip, typically the way that you would normally see this written down is, so the standard Ising model, if you like, would be this, but with Zs. Um, and then nothing else. Uh, what I have essentially done is exploited a sort of symmetry of the spins, uh, which is to say that if you have, so you can compactly write down the commutators for all three spins as sigma alpha, sigma beta is 2i epsilon alpha beta gamma, sigma gamma. Uh, and it turns out if you choose an arbitrary R SO3, um, then and define new spins, sigma squiggle alpha is R alpha beta, sigma beta, uh, then these sigma squiggles will all, all obey exactly the same commutation relations. So 
so um, if you're a mathematician that says that SO3 is like an automorphism of the Lie algebra, uh, if you're a physicist that says I have a spin that lives in real space and it shouldn't matter which way is X because it's a spin, it, it, the, the universe has no coordinate system, it should be SO3, it should be invariant under any kind of rotation you do. Um, so what I have done here is taken the normal sigma z sigma z and actually have rotated about the like x rotated about some axis in order to turn sigma z into some linear combination of x's and y's, uh, and have turned the normal this is normally sigma x, but I've turned that into sigma z, um, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is the this is the Ising chain. Um, and if you, yeah, first of all, just imagine chopping this off and writing it in the sigma x basis. So up means an eigen, eigenstate of the sigma x operator. Uh, the space that this is acting on is isomorphic to c to the 2n. Uh, c, sorry, c to the 2l, because we have l spins and all of those spins can either be up or down. So the, dimension, the total dimension of our Hilbert space is uh, two to the l. Wait, is that is that right? Have I or have I cooked that? That's okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. So in other words, there are nearest neighbor interactions, uh, and because this has got a minus sign, and we'll take all of the constants as positive just for simplicity, um, because it's like if you have a term that's like minus sigma x sigma x, or rather, I write it as z's for if you have minus sigma z sigma z, for example, and I'll just say it one and two, let's talk about like the two spin Ising quote unquote chain. Um, then there are four possible basis states, down, 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 up, up, down, and up, up. And the energies that they correspond to is in this one, minus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. So in general, the ground state could be any linear combination of these two. Uh, and sorry, by the ground state, I mean the uh, sort of eigenvector with the minimum eigenvalue. Um, so yeah, in, in short, uh, we expect, so, so yeah, the ground state uh, has, it has a very, very like sort of important meaning because if you imagine taking a physical sample and cooling it down, it will naturally settle into the ground state. Um, so from a field theory perspective, uh, a state like just all downs, uh, we might want to think about that as the vacuum. Uh, so that like we define like some operator, for example, uh, sigma plus J, uh, which will make, which will like flip the jth spin. So it might be a more useful language to talk about these spins, not as spins, but as sort of excitations above a vacuum. Um, so we could go for a, through a tortured discussion about hard things called hardcore bosons, but instead I'm gonna to cut to the chase and just introduce what a fermion is. Um, so a fermion is a pair of operators f dagger and f, uh, so that that act on a space which is span zero and one, uh, defined by f dagger acting on the vacuum is one, and f acting on one is zero. Uh, f dagger one zero and f zero is zero. I have to apologize here to anyone that is, is viewing this notation for the first time. You'll note that cat zero, meaning the vacuum, is a very different thing to the number zero because this is like the zero vector in Hilbert space, whereas this is a physical state. Um, these are not the same, not even remotely. Um, like, yeah, in the spin language, zero corresponds to like spin down 
with something. So yeah, back to back back on target. Um, so you can actually explicitly check uh, by yeah, sort of writing these things down that um, f f dagger plus f dagger f acting on anything is always zero, uh, which we would write down as an anti-commutator. Um, uh, but more interestingly, if we want to think about like, wait, has, that's not right, is it? No. Apologies for that. <laughs> you can explicitly check based on this like definition that um, any two fermions on the same side um, satisfy the anti-commutator. Uh, sorry, I keep calling things. Anti-commutator of f with f dagger is two, i.e. like this operator acts like the number two on any state. Uh, but the anti-commutator of f with itself is the anti-commutator of f dagger with itself. And you can see that this is just like two f squared. And so because the first f will lower one to zero, uh, the second f will annihilate the zero to the zero number. Um, Uh, equals zero. For the weird thing that they do is that when you have more than one firm kind of fermion, like Fi and Fj, uh, they also anti-commute, uh, which is a kind of a weird thing because it means that somehow if you have like a fermion like on site I and a fermion on site J, then to some extent the phase or like the sign in front of the fermion on site J depends on whether or not site I is occupied. Um, so it's like having, having a zero commutator has a very natural interpretation as meaning that the two things are independent, whereas having a zero anti-commutator is a bit sort of wonkier. Now, let's remember the original thing that we're going to do. What I'm going to do with this thing is turn everything into a fermion. Because I, yeah, I want to stress that the 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 end goal of our, all of these discussions, when I say like solve the transverse Ising model, I mean find some kind of a transformation on these operators so that I can write down H as a quadratic Hamiltonian. Uh, e, J, um, A dagger, J, A, J. So this is like a canonical form. It looks like a, it looks like N harmonic oscillators and it says, whatever these A eigenstates, whatever eigenstates I have of this like A dagger A thing, uh, that gives me a contribution of EJ. And so I can like very clearly understand like what, what the ground, first of all, what the ground state is of the Hamiltonian, i.e. what is the state so that AJ acting on that thing is zero everywhere. Uh, and also like what do the excitations look like? Um, because every one of these EJs is an excitation. Sorry, I've been like sort of speed running. I want to, pause and possibly get Matt and Temba to chime in to like explain what I mean there. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I haven't really seen this before. I mean I know it's a canonical form, but mm. I haven't really seen it and heard that explanation before. But it makes sense, right? Mm. Um so, I then assume that like uh because that's essentially the number operator, right? Yeah, exactly. Then, so, yeah, then that's just a, the E epsilon J would just be like a density, wouldn't it? An energy density. Hmm. So, when you apply the number operator, you get the actual energy out. Yeah, exactly. So, if you have like, so I mean, taking these A's to be like, say, fermions, um, another thing that 
is sort of you can sort of check explicitly because there are only four fun defining relations uh, is that if you have like f dagger f acting on like zero uh, then f zero is and then you get like the number zero times ket zero now this is the zero ket um, so it's not like a physical state but like for the purposes of like quantum mechanics all we care about is like the eigenvalue under this operator so if we've totally annihilated the state um, that is still an eigenvector it's just a trivial one because it's the zero eigenvector um, whereas if you have f dagger f acting on one you get one times one so the eigenvalue is one so like that particular like composite operator f dagger f has got like a special meaning um and yeah if we have like multiple flavors of these uh they have the same like index on them this has a special meaning and it's called number operator because when you act it on any state the eigenvalue is the number of fermions i've also kind of glossed over an important sort of technicality, which is that in general, after doing this transformation, we might end up with some constant left over. Uh, but like a shift of every, for the sake of like keeping consistent with the field theory language, if we ever end up in the situation that we have a constant left over, we will immediately ignore it because the physical things that we can measure are like changes in energy between different states. We can't measure absolute energy we can't measure absolute potential energies so it's just a convenient convention to define like the state with no excitations as having zero energy going back to like the classical this ising chain um the energy the actual energy as written with this hamiltonian uh would actually be like negative j times n because sorry uh, sorry l minus one because we have like L minus one links that give us uh, an energy gain of J. Um, but in the field theory language, uh, this will just be zero energy because the vacuum has zero energy by definition. Um, so by that definition, as long as we can make sure that all of these energies are positive, uh, we know that the lowest energy state is one in which these number operators acting on the state are always zero. Um, and in fact, like an equivalent way of writing that is just saying that every one of these AJs annihilates the state. Cool. Hopefully, hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, so now what we're going to construct is the Jordan Wigner algebra isomorphism <laughs> which is to say we want to define so i will yeah just tell you what it is uh, i'm going to define first of all kj which is the product from l equals one to j minus one sigma z l two important things to notice first of all kj squared um is a product of sigma l z squareds uh i'm just allowed to do that because all these sigma sigma l's on different sites commute with each other uh and because sigma z's can be interpreted as those Pauli matrices um where was it yeah like one minus one squared is one uh this whole thing is one the other thing to notice is that sigma z equals sigma z dagger, uh, i.e. kj is both unitary and hermitian. So kj squared is one uh, and kj inverse is kj dagger, uh, which is also kj. Um, <laughs> we love it. Um, Cool. So yeah, K, KJ, KJ exists uh, and it depends on sigmas. And we're going to define just some operator. Uh, we're going to eventually prove that they're fermions, but we're going to define some operator, CJ, 
the unhabited culture. I think it's just going to be habit. Okay. Uh, CJ is KJ times sigma J plus. Yeah. Um, and C dagger J is KJ sigma J minus. Uh, or equivalently, CJ dagger. <laughs> These are the same. Um, one thing I want to bring up is that the sigma J pluses are not Hermitian, so their eigenvalues are not necessarily real. Um, uh, and further, they don't commute with the. They definitely don't commute with the sigma Z with sigma J Z. Uh, but that's actually fine because this thing doesn't depend on sigma j z. It only depends on like all of the sigmas before it. So yeah, sorry. The, the actual physical picture of it is like we start at the beginning of the chain and we sort of go through multiplying by a minus one every time we see a spin down. Uh, but we don't. In, if we have like k j, we don't include the sigma j uh, just so that. Uh, kj sigma j plus is the same thing as sigma j plus kj. That's just a convenient, that's just part of the construction. So in order to prove that these are fermions, we could either check what they do to the equivalent states, or we can show that they follow the canonical fermion anti-commutation relations. Oh, sorry, I skipped a part of what I had planned. Um, one thing, I, yeah. So I, I never actually mentioned like what spaces act on. So a singles fermion acts on like the span of zero and one. Now, remembering that these are distinguishable fermions and not indistinguishable particles because then things get weirder. Um, these are distinguishable fermions. Um, and so actually when you have two fermions, you have like two copies of span zero one. So actually the dimension, the space that these live in is, I wanna write it as F N, uh, which is isomorphic to C to the two N again. So the motivation for even trying to represent spins as fermions is that if you have N fermions, the Hilbert space is exactly the same dimensionality as N spin halves. Um, and yeah, in terms of like actually, actually representing something that lives in this space, uh, you could write it as like zero one, as like a bit string, uh, where like each one of these rep represents like whether or not which where each number here represents an eigenvalue of a particular CJ dagger CJ operator. Um, yeah, like in physics language, what you might say is that like the commutate, if you actually commute the commutator of like CJ dagger CJ with a CK dagger CK, uh, what you'll notice is something kind of interesting, which is even though these are fermions, um, CJ dagger, CJ, CK dagger, CK minus CK dagger, CK, CJ dagger, CJ. So if we want to move like this first C to the right, uh, it goes like one hop, gets a factor of minus one because these two anti-commute. Um, then another minus one because these two because these two anti commute. So actually, we can just move that and not add an extra minus one to the front. Or if if you like, I'll add like minus one squared. Uh, and we can do the same thing with the other CJ dagger because J and K are different sites. Uh, and in fact, you get zero. Oh, isn't that big? So actually what we've done is something kind of important. We have, oh yeah, and if and if they're on the same site, they trivially commute because they're the same operator. Um, so actually 
J because J is allowed to be like one all the way up to L, we have N commuting operators uh, with two possible eigenvalues. I.e., if you tried to like construct the basis as saying, I want them to be simultaneous eigenstates of all N number operators. This is your basis and it spans the entire space. Um, so in short, like as a general principle, if you know, if you can find like a set of commuting observables uh, that each like, yeah, like um, you'd say, because this has two possible eigenvalues, it has dimension two. Um, so if you have like a complete set of, of commuting observables, i.e. a set of observables that all commute with each other and are complete in the sense that like, if you add up the dimension of every commuting observable, or sorry, product of the dimension of every commuting observable, you get the dimension of the space, uh, then you actually have a way, a systematic way of constructing a useful basis for the space. Um, and that is how you construct the basis for say, I, and that's how you construct the basis for something like quantum field theory, in fact, or in fact, any quantum mechanics. The final thing I'll say is that this is actually cumbersome because you don't want to write out bit strings regularly, but unless you're in quantum information or something. So an alternative way of phrasing this is to actually write it as like a product of operators acting on the vacuum. CJ dagger to the NJ acting on vacuum. Um, where these NJs is a, a, like some bit string. So I've like moved the bit string to the front, but I'd actually argue this is a more useful form of way to write down basis vectors uh, because it fixes the sign convention. Like you'll notice because these CJ daggers anti-commute, their order matters a lot. Um, and this product has just chosen to do it one, two, three, four, up to L. Uh, in principle, you could do it any other way and you still get a, a basis, but you get a different basis. Um, and with a representation as a bit string, it's not clear how that sign has been chosen. So generally speaking, when writing down bases, you would write it with a representation like that. Um, and we, we actually, I think Kemba, we might've seen something before when you were talking about coherent states like a year ago. Solid, yeah. So yeah, sorry, back to, back to the transverse field Ising model. Um, We've constructed these CJs and CJ daggers. Uh, we need to show that they actually satisfy the anti-commutator relations. Um, what, what you need to show to do this is that the anti-commutator of CJ, C, I don't want to use CK because I'm going to use that for something else later. So CN with CM is zero is anti-commutator of CN dagger. CM dagger and anti commutator of CN with CM dagger is. Is there meant to be a two there? No, there isn't. Delta NM. Uh, and I'm actually going to skip doing the algebra in the interest of time because it's not very illuminating, but you can. Suffice to say, you can actually do this. Um, and actually that proves that this transformation actually does turn the spins, quote unquote, turn the spins into fermions. So explicitly the jordan wigner algebra isomorphism would takes um, sigma plus to, um, kj cj sigma minus to kj c dagger j um and yeah that's actually all you need 
Now you might say, hang on, this is this doesn't make sense because the right hand side still has sigma z's lying around. As it will turn out, that won't actually matter as much as you think, because if you write down sigma plus, we can actually get sigma z in terms of sigma pluses and sigma minuses from one of the anti some from, from one of the um, commutators I wrote down earlier. So commutator of sigma plus j, sigma minus j. Uh, is two sigma z j. Um, so sort of plugging everything in, we would have like cj kj kj cj dagger minus cj dagger kj kj cj is two sigma z. Uh, or in other words, because these are kj squares uh, and we love sigma z because it squares to one, um, we actually just have a commutator of C with C dagger. Um, or probably more helpfully using that, that anti-commutator relation, uh, anti-commutator of CJ, CJ dagger is one. So CJ, CJ dagger is one minus CJ dagger CJ. Uh, so in other words, um, yeah, two sigma j z. Hang on, there's not meant to be a two there. Yeah, there's no two there. Yeah, sorry. Um, going back to how, as for how that happened. Um, right at the start. Uh, I snuck this factor of a half out the front of sigma plus and sigma minus, which means that this just become, there's no two there. It's just plus or minus sigma plus minus. Um, epic prank. Epic prank. Um, <laughs> if, you, if, if, if you thought that was an epic <laughs> prank, leave a comment down below. Um, Wait, anyway. <laughs> won't, that, that, won't that like extra factor of a half like not matter because like you get, like if you didn't, def I'll just do the commutator. Uh, no, it, no, it matters because it's sigma plus with sigma minus, and they both give you a half. And sigma plus with sigma minus gives you sigma z, and it's just no. There's, there's no, no two. factor of two. There's no yeah, two. you get the, you get the two when you do sigma plus with sigma z, or plus or sigma minus with sigma z. Oh, I, there should be. A what was was this actually fine? Yeah. We're not using that one. We're using we're using the top one there. Oh sigma yeah, plus yeah, right. Minus is two, your sigma z. Yeah. And there should be the two that if you rescale the sigma like plus minus, it's just gonna rescale your output as well. And so it's still need mm. two. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, nice. No, sorry about that. Um So in other words, sigma z ends up being represented as one minus two c dagger c, uh, which is good because this looks like a number operator, um, which has a clear inter a clear field theoretic interpretation. Um, the other result I want to establish real quick. I've done the thing where my writing gets huge. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to establish real quick is we need to transform. Yeah. So writing down the Hamiltonian again. H is some uh, minus JX, sigma X, sigma X, minus JY, sigma Y, sigma Y, uh, minus H, some sigma Z, sigma Z. No, sorry, just sigma z. Can we explain to you, Sam, that that last term is just essentially a magnetic field? Yeah, the last term's like interaction with the, with the swings of the magnetic fields, and um, the rest of like interactions in like the other directions between spin. Mm. And we're ignoring like spin up with spin up. 
in like spin spin interactions, right? Oh no, these are the spin in those are the spin spin interactions. No, but there's none in the sigma z direction. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we're, now we're ignoring those. Is it just? I thought that's it? what you were saying earlier. With like, you had a z. Uh, it, this is essentially a one-dimensional Ising chain, but then you've just transformed it. Yeah, it's 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 a one-dimensional Ising chain that I have like turned formally. Yeah, so there's only a z direction. It's not. Uh, well, oh, sorry, it's not. It's not quite that. Um, another the way this is one way this is often written down is like j sum j sigma z sigma z uh minus h sigma x so like there isn't any basis you can find where all of these are um the same sigma sigma operator okay yeah so like um so like remember, so sigma x like looks like one one. So what that kind of does is it couples the spin up and spin down directions. Um, and the reason that I say that like so without the h there, there kind of wouldn't be anything to do because, in a sense, this is any spin you can write down in the canonical basis of like sigma z eigenstates uh, is already an eigenvector of this Hamiltonian. Um, so there's kind of nothing else you have to do in order to solve it, like you've, you're already done. The game we're trying to play is, find, is finding a useful basis to write a Hamiltonian in, in such a way that it's diagonal. Um, so like if you're a computer the task is trivial but it's actually not that trivial because the like size of the matrix you need to diagonalize goes exponentially with the number of sites so as soon as you have more than like 30 sites trying to do this with a by brute force um is no longer possible uh which is why we need to do all this janky by hand stuff um yeah so the um, the next transformation I'm going to do is to say like sigma x is sigma plus plus sigma minus and sigma y is one on i into sigma plus minus sigma minus. So by redefining constants that we don't particularly care about, we can write down h as minus j sum over the nearest neighbors of Sigma plus sigma. Just going to quickly check my notes. Sigma minus sigma plus. Plus, uh, yeah, I'll call, I'll call this kappa, even though it's probably something else in Cyrillic. I think it's E. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I've seen people write down this symbol and call it kappa before. I don't quite know why. Um. Well, I think that's how you can also write down, uh, like if you bend the last part. Oh, uh, yeah. Kind of like kappa. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, I'll keep writing it like that, um, but just imagine that it's bent and to be into a kappa. Um, So crucially, like plus HC here means plus the Hermitian conjugate of everything in front of it. So sigma minus sigma plus uh, using like our rules from earlier, sigma minus sigma plus became um, C dagger KJ uh, becomes Hey, Alaric, random question. Are we considering periodic boundary conditions or is that not relevant at this time? Oh boy, this is this is actually so relevant. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I've been deliberately vague with writing the indices here but because it turns out the kind of boundary conditions you impose make solving this with fermions a lot harder. Um, 
Yeah. So you just keep remain, yeah. I'm just going uh, for now, but I'll, I'll, I'll unvague it eventually. Okay, no, I'll, I'll unvague <laughs> it now since you've explicitly called me out on my bullshit. Um, no, it's fine. I'm fine keeping it vague, but. Yeah, yeah. So, so, that so. Can, that can be like the hook for the next episode. What are the boundary conditions going to be? Oh, boy. Oh, no, I haven't gone gotten through as much as I wanted to. But yeah, uh, H open boundary conditions is sum J equals one to L minus one. Uh, and this is sum over J equals one to L. So in other words, there is like a sad spin at the very beginning uh, and at the very end that has no friend. Um, uh, and then we would also write down um, HPBC is HOBC um, minus J into sigma minus sigma plus L one uh, plus E sigma minus sigma minus. Uh, and that's it. Where this is like just a, a mysterious extra link that uh, connects the front to the back. So it turns it into a topological ring. Um, what else did I want? Did I need to mention? Um, no, that's about it. Uh, so yeah, my it's probably worth. So if I apply apply this transformation and say, um, sigma, then you can notice that like sigma minus j, sigma plus j plus one equals cj kj kj plus one c dagger j plus one. So kj kj plus one is, the pro is a product of sigma z's. Um, L equals one to J minus one. Uh, so crucially, every sigma Z here gets squared except for sigma ZJ. Uh, that one still hangs on. Uh, and we're also gonna replace sigma ZJ with one minus two C dagger J CJ. Um, and we end up with, so CJ, Sigma Z, J, C dagger J plus one, which is CJ into one minus two C dagger J, CJ, C dagger J plus one. Now, if you've seen this before, you might think, there is a, four operator term here, but actually this is fine because we have CJ, CJ dagger, CJ, uh, which is um, CJ minus, sorry, um, one minus, C dagger J, CJ, CJ, using that anti-commutator. Uh, but that CJ, CJ uh, becomes squares to zero. So this thing is actually just CJ. Um, so we had CJ, C dagger, J plus one uh, minus two. CJ, CJ dagger, CJ, CJ dagger, CJ plus one dagger, uh, which is CJ, C dagger, J plus one minus two times. So this thing is just, remember this thing is just CJ. Uh, so at the end of the day, we only have negative CJ, C dagger, J plus one. By a similar argument, uh, you can show that, so that is, sorry, negative, equals negative CJ, C dagger, J plus one, 
Um, yep, uh, and by a similar argument, you can show that sigma minus j sigma. Oh no, did I cook it? Yeah, I cooked it, sorry. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but like me all the time. <laughs> Sigma minus got the C dagger, not the C. So this is all meant to be daggered and that's not meant to be daggered. Uh, so forget all of that. Um, so yeah, because it's, um, that, that actually makes life a lot easier. That becomes like CJ dagger into one minus two C dagger J, CJ, CJ plus one, and very concretely CJ dagger, CJ dagger squares to zero. So that is just CJ dagger, CJ plus one. Everything is fine. It's just, we have a minus one and a dagger on the other side. And by the same token, Sigma minus J, Sigma minus J plus one uh, is C dagger J C J plus one. If you don't believe me, um, okay, yeah, that one's an exercise. Yeah, that is an exercise. Um, <laughs> now, there are five minutes remaining, uh, and I want to quickly sneak in a discussion of why the boundary conditions are a bit horrendous. So, surely you'd think. So first of all, I want to say, um, if you have open boundary conditions, everything is fine uh, because there is a well-defined start and end point. Uh, you don't need to think about anything weird happening. With periodic boundary conditions, on the other hand, this term creates a bit of strife, um, which is sort of to be expected because this whole Jordan-Wigner transformation work was based on the existence of like, counting from a beginning. And you might expect that when you go to a ring shape, uh, the notion of counting from a certain beginning becomes a bit sort of sideways. Um, so specifically what we need is a representation of sigma L minus sigma one plus plus E sigma minus L sigma one minus plus HC. Uh, so if, if it were possible to do like, and there's a minus J at the front, which I may as well carry through. So if it were possible to do a Jordan Wigner, if naively you would expect, um, periodic boundary conditions to look like minus J. Um, so we know the Sigma minuses, Sigma pluses kind of act like C dagger C's. So C dagger L C one plus E C dagger. L C dagger one plus H C. Uh, but in fact, that's not the case. Um, uh, which you can see if you do the, ex the explicit transformation because we end up with uh, C L dagger um, K L. Uh, K one is just one because that's an empty product. There are no spins before one. K L times C one. Sorry, I promise this won't take too long. Um, plus E times C dagger L K L C L C one C dagger one. Um, but yeah, let's look carefully at C that uh, which is and remember because K L and C L commute, uh, we can pull it out the front for convenience. Uh, so look carefully at um, KLCL that, yeah, sorry. In fact, we can factorize the whole CL dagger out the front and just end up with this. Uh, but remember that that HC conjugates everything and including flipping it. Um, so KL uh, CL dagger is um, 
yeah, product L equals one to capital minus one sigma Z, see L dagger. There's actually a nicer representation of that in terms of fermions. So that is equal to the same product of one minus two C dagger little l c little l c l there um so think so if you think for a second uh just just on a on a particular site right one minus two c dagger l c l acting on zero will get you one minus zero which is one whereas one minus two c dagger l c l acting on one will get you one minus two times one, so negative one. So you can actually re-express that as e to the i pi c dagger l c l. Like every term in the, in the middle of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that in fact, we can, without loss of generality, include the elf component in this product. So sorry, one thing at a time. You can rewrite that expression as, ex as being the exponential i pi sum l equals one to l capital L minus one uh, c dagger l c l c dagger l. Uh, and the final thing is you can show that C dagger capital L, C capital L, C dagger capital L, that is a number operator acting on something that has come after a C dagger L. Uh, so actually the only eigenvalue, you can, you can prove explicitly by checking both of the cases that that is always the same thing as writing, um, one times C dagger L. Um, yeah, you can check that. If this if this is already one, then you, you get zero. So zero is still zero. If it's zero though, then it's like number operator acting on one. Uh, so you get one. Um, so that, yeah, e to the i pi, c dagger l, c l, c dagger l is exactly the same thing as negative c dagger l by that logic, because you just get e to the i pi times one, which is negative c dagger l. Um, so in short, what you can actually do is include that, include the elf component in the sum uh, and introduce a minus sign at the front. So now the reason we've done that is that the sum of all of the C dagger L C Ls uh, is saying how many fermions are in the system. Um, and that has, is special and we call that the capital N hat operator. Um, you can prove that this is a Hermitian, this is, you can prove that this is a Hermitian operator. Um, it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian, notably because the Hamiltonian involves, did I ever write down the full fermion Hamiltonian? Oh no, I did not. Yeah, the, the, the full fermion Hamiltonian using those identities we derived was H is minus J uh, sum for open boundary conditions, minus J sum L equals one, two, capital minus one. Uh, C dagger J C J plus E C dagger J C dagger J plus one. Uh, and the reason that the capital N operator doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian is that we've got these double double creation and double annihilation operators. Yeah, sorry for sorry for forgetting to write that down. So to get to this, all I've done is taken the spin Hamiltonian in terms of the sigma pluses and the sigma minuses. 
um, with redefined variables where like J and E depend on JX and JY. And, but with by sort of fairly simple linear combinations. Um, and then when you transform all those spins, you end up with a fermion Hamiltonian that looks like this. And because it's got double creation, double annihilation operators, the number of the total number of fermions in the system is not conserved, i.e. the commutator of H over C with N hat is not zero. But negative one to the N hat, i.e. the whether i.e. like the number of fermions modulo two does commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, and in fact, the, this sort of extra term that sort of stitches on the extra, the extra connection from L to one can be expressed quite uh, simple, quite, um, what's the word? Compactly as minus j times negative one to the n hat plus one into c dagger one, c one, c dagger, sorry, c dagger l c one plus c dagger l c dagger one plus h c. So I forgot the factor of e. Uh, and that's the only term that that couple and sorry and remember like h p b c is h o b c minus this stuff. So crucially, what that means is that as, as if you have we've transformed like this the spin chain into a fermion chain. Uh, but now um, the nature of the coupling that goes from the first to the uh, the first to the last spin depends on the parity of the system. So because so first of all, what I want to say, the Hilbert space we're acting on is f to the n, uh, f n, like which is isomorphic to c to the two n. Sorry, Matt, I'll let you go in just a second. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, but because negative to the n commutes with HOBC, this can be split and decomposed into F odd, which is dimension n minus one direct sum F even of dimension n minus one. Uh, and depending on which sector we're in, whether we're, if we're in the odd sector, then negative to the n plus one is one and we have periodic boundary conditions. Uh, whereas if we're in the even sector, we have a minus one and we actually have anti-periodic boundary conditions where it looks like the sign of the coupling of the last fermion to the first fermion has been changed to minus one. And we'll, that's where we'll have to leave it for today. But um, what we'll see next time is that by dividing Hilbert space, you can diagonalize it separately in each sector um, and then ultimately put it together to get what the full dynamics of the system are. Thanks, Alaric. Thanks thank for you. stopping by. Uh, thank you. Yes, oh. I will have to. Yeah. Uh,